How many people here love a new year? I love a new year because for me, a new year is a symbol of a new beginning. And we're going to be talking about that this morning. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Uh, you know, truly, I love a new beginning. Be understanding that I have a whole fresh start. There's things like goals that I want to accomplish, and I can set these goals. I can make for me a, a whole plan of what I'm going to do this year. And the title of this morning's message is Modus Operandi. You guys might have heard the term M.O. What's that person's M.O.? How is it that they do the things that they do? Basically, what is their mode of operation? How do they accomplish things in their lives? And we all have good intentions, don't we? Each and every one of us, we have intentions of losing the 10 pounds, like that guy said, or we want to be nicer to our parents, or we want to give our lives to the Lord in a way we never have. We want to serve God. We want to be patient. All these things that we want to do, we have good intentions. And yet, how we carry out those intentions, the way we do the things we know we should do, is of the utmost importance, especially when we have specific instructions. You know, when I got married, this was 18 years ago, I decided one day I was going to do the laundry for my wife. And I just thought, I'm going to bless my wife. I'm going to make sure that when she gets home, all the laundry's done, it's dried, it's folded, it's put away, and she's going to be so happy. And I put all the whites into the, to the uh, wash machine, and there's this stuff called bluing. Anybody know what bluing is? It's this stuff you put in your white laundry. It actually has a tint of blue, but it's supposed to make your whites look really bright and fresh and clean. And so I thought, I'm going to bless my wife. I'm going to go get this bluing, and I'm going to put it in with our whites, and I'm going to make sure that she is so blessed when she sees this laundry. Well, I'm sure you know where this is going. The specific instructions that were on there on how much to put in this, I didn't follow those specific instructions. I had very good intentions, and yet I didn't follow the instructions. And when my wife got home, instead of being all happy, she was very upset. We were a young couple. We didn't have a lot of money, and now all of our whites were blue. And so it was kind of a blessing for me in the long run because it's been almost 18 years and I haven't had to do laundry. But, but truly, <laughs> I wanted to be a blessing to my wife. My intentions were good. The way I carried out what I wanted to do was not right. I didn't follow the instructions. And truly, uh, for us, God, as we have these, these intentions this year, Maybe you want to be a better spouse. You want to be a better parent. You want to get your finances under control. You want to be a better employee. You, there's all these things that we want to do. God has given us very specific instructions for every aspect of our lives. And how we carry up, out those things is so important because there's a way that seems right to us, but God has given us very specific instructions. So maybe this year, as you take a look at your life and you take a look at the goals that you're setting for yourself, maybe this year you need to change your MO. And I want to go over this morning a historical record of a man that had a new start on life. He had a very new start and God gave him very specific instructions. And let's see how this man does with his new start in life. Let's take a look at Mark chapter 1 beginning in verse 40, now a leper came to him, that is, came to Jesus, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So here's this man approaching the Lord, this man with this disease called leprosy, and this is one of the horrific di uh, diseases of the ancient world. Even today, we have uh, over 15 million people across the world that are affected by this. I've seen it because typically it's in third world countries. I've seen people with leprosy over there in Indonesia, and even in India to this day, they still have over 1,000 leper colonies where they've just separated these people from the rest of society for fear of catching what they have. 
Now, when somebody gets this disease, it starts off with a very small red dot on the skin, and it starts to get bigger. It starts to turn white. It gets real shiny and kind of looks like scales on the person's uh, skin. After a while, it's spread over the entire body. The hair begins to fall out. The fingernails and the toenails begin to rot and fall off. And then because of secondary infections where the joints are, the limbs of the person's body start to fall off. The gums begin to shrink to the point where they can't even hold the teeth in. And so all the teeth begin to fall out. The nose, the palate, and even the eyes begin to rot in the person's body. Eventually, the infected person dies from this just rotting their entire body. And it's no wonder God uses leprosy in the Bible as a picture and a type of sin. You know, we start off with our sin and it may seem small, just a little red dot. It's barely noticeable. Nobody sees it on me. And so I'm kind of getting away with it right now. Nobody can tell that I'm doing this sin. But after a while, that sin begins to grow bigger and bigger. It starts to eat up our body. And it be after a while, it's just so abundantly clear. Look, look at that person. I mean, the, the sin's all over them. And you can just see it's just eating us up from the inside out. That's why God uses leprosy as a picture and type of sin. And to literally add insult to injury, the worst part about having leprosy may be how the leper was treated. Lepers had to dress like somebody who's mourning for the dead. Uh, they were literally considered the living dead. Uh, they would have to warn people as people would come close to them. They would have to shout out, unclean, unclean. So that way people who were walking by knew that they had leprosy. And then people would say that the leper had this as a result of sin. And so they would tell you know, them that this was a punishment from God. And I want you to notice, with all of this being said about leprosy, I want you to notice how approachable Jesus is. In the midst of this, with all this suffering that's going on in this man's life, and as scared as people are of that disease, he walks right up to the Lord. And I wonder when I read this, I wonder where his disciples are at. These men who later on will hear they chased off these women for bringing kids to the Lord. He's, these women are trying to bring children up to him and they're chasing them away. Be gone. Get away. You know. And Jesus is like, what are you doing? Let the kids come up to me. He's so approachable. Where are these men that are you know, so willing to chase off women and children when here comes this man with this disease that everybody's afraid of? How come they're not chasing him away? So here's this man who's basically, he's the untouchable, and he walks right up to Jesus. And notice what he says to Jesus. He says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. If you're willing, you can make me clean. What you believe about the power of Jesus, you have to believe for yourself. What I mean by that is oftentimes we look at what the Lord does in other people's lives, and we say, wow, look at, look at the restoration that took place in their marriage. Wow, the Lord really did great for them. Boy, look at this person got healed of this disease. Great, the Lord really did something good for them. Look at this person and their finances. They were down in the dumps. And man, the Lord has truly blessed them. Their business is booming. They're doing so well at work. The money's coming in. Wow, the Lord really does good things for them. You've got to believe that for yourself. You're God's child. God loves you and he wants to bless you. And what you believe that he can do, like this man, he says, if you want to, you could make me well. Believe that for you. The Lord can do amazing things for your life. And notice he says, Lord, if you're willing. He's submitted to the will of God. He says, Lord, if you want to do this, it's up to you. I, I submit myself to you and your will. If you're willing, you can make me clean. We all have something we need to be cleansed of. Maybe we have bad habits. Maybe we're quick to anger. Maybe we've got a bad thought life. And we need God to cleanse that for us this year. Believe that God can do it and submit yourself to his will and take a look at what can happen. Take a look at verse 41. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and touched him, and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. 
Jesus was moved with compassion. Oftentimes, we can be moved with compassion when it comes to somebody who's sick. I spent the first, you know, probably five years of my life at Chalk Hospital. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's Children's Hospital, Orange County, Chalk Hospital. I spent my time there because I had a brother who had cancer, who eventually died there at Chalk Hospital. And I'll never forget it because I was six, he was five. I remember as a six-year-old knowing that my brother was there and in my mother's arms told my mother, I'm going home. And what he meant was not I'm going home to our house, he meant I'm going to heaven. He looked up at my mom, he told her that, and he died in her arms. And so for me, I can go to a hospital and I can have compassion on someone. It's very easy for a lot of us to have compassion on people that are sick like that. We know, I mean, just by a show of hands, how many of you know somebody that's been affected by cancer? Look around the room. I don't see anybody's hand not up. I mean, we all know somebody who's been affected by cancer. It's so, it's so rampant in our society, in our world today. And so for us to have compassion on somebody who's dealing with that is very easy. However, somebody who was dealing with leprosy, not so much. Here's the thing is leprosy didn't really invoke compassion in people. It invoked fear. People were like, I can't be around it. I'm nervous what will happen. Look at how they look. I mean, it, it says in Luke's gospel when it's talking about this situation here that this man was full of leprosy. In other words, he was in the advanced stages of leprosy. It wasn't like he had the little red speck on, on his arm or something. This man was full of it. His eyes were rotting. His nose was rotting. His fingers, he's been losing limbs. This man was in the advanced stages. It wasn't like, oh, well, let's have compassion on him. It was, hey, get away from that guy. Don't get near him. You're going to catch what he has. It just invoked fear, but not with the Lord. The Lord had compassion on this man. And you know, oftentimes, modern day things that are going on, we can have some sort of fear about people. Maybe somebody who uh, is on methamphetamines and they've been on it for a long time. If you've seen somebody, the transformation that takes place when somebody starts taking methamphetamines, they start off all handsome or beautiful, and over time, and sometimes very quickly, you see a picture of them later on. And they've been picking at their face and their teeth are rotting out. And, and we can almost be like, God, oh, I just don't want to get near that person. Because you just feel like, like something gross is about going on with that. And so we have this kind of fear. I would say that God wants us to have compassion on people. He wants us to love people. And we can, you know, we can say, hey, it's their fault. They brought it upon themselves. But that's not the heart of the Lord. God wants us to be compassionate with people. He reaches out and he touches this man. And as soon as he did, verse 42, I love this. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. We love it when prayers are answered like that, don't we? When we pray a prayer, when we go to the Lord and say, Lord, will you do this? And he just speaks and it happens. We love those immediately answered prayers. Even when it's a no, but what we hate is wait. We hate that time of waiting. And as I was studying on this and I was meditating about this verse, I was thinking about the man at the pool of Bethesda. Here's this man for over three decades had been waiting for a healing. Waiting every day. Somebody would take him there and he's waiting for the waters to be stored, stirred so he can go into the water and be healed. Over 30 years had gone by until he got healed. We as believers in Christ, we have to be willing to be patient, but we certainly love it when the Lord answers our prayers right away. And the Lord answered his prayer, touched him, healed him, and he strictly warned him in verse 33 and sent him away at once. What is it that the Lord strictly warned him? Well, it doesn't tell us here. But we can imagine from other accounts in the Gospels what he might have said. For instance, the man at the pool of Bethesda, the Lord healed him. What did he say? Go and what? Sin no more. What about the woman that was brought out from adultery, brought out in the very act 
brought out in front of everybody to be humiliated and stoned. And the Lord started writing in the sand and said, who's ever without sin, cast the first stone. And all of a sudden, one by one, they started to leave. And all that was left was Jesus and this woman. And he said, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, they're gone, Lord. He says, well, neither do I condemn you. Go and what? Sin no more. You see, when the Lord touches our lives and we ask for a blessing, the Lord says, I'm going to bless you, but I want you to go and I want you to sin no more. In other words, our lives should be transformed as we meet with the Lord. As we receive his blessings, we should have a life that's holy and set apart for him, for his purposes. Go and sin no more. So the Lord strictly warned him and set him away at once. And, in verse 44, said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priests, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So what is it that the Lord's doing here? The Lord's sending him away to go and meet with the priest and go through a ceremony. What is the ceremony that he wants him to go through? Well, we find it in Leviticus chapter 14, and it says this. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall examine him. And indeed, if the leprosy is healed from the leper, then the priest shall command to take for him who is cleansed two living and clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop, and dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall, set, and shall let the living bird loose in the open field. He is to be cleansed, shall wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, and wash himself in water, that he may be clean. After that, he shall come into the camp, and shall stay outside his tent for seven days." But on the seventh day he shall shave all the hair off his head and his beard and his eyebrows and all the hair shall be shaved off. He shall wash his clothes and wash his body in water and he shall be clean. Oh, that is a mouthful. I mean, all of that had to take place. The Lord sending this man to go and be separated from everybody for this week of purification, for all these things to take place, the Lord is sending him on this small journey. Imagine being the priest that gets that call. Hey, uh, Rabbi, come on over here. Got to talk to you. There's this guy who's been healed of leprosy, and so you need to do this ceremony for him. How many times do you think this guy's done this ceremony? Zero. I mean, how many people have been healed from this? It's not like modern day where we've got antibiotics. You give it to the person and literally within that year, they're healed from leprosy. We've got that capability now. Back then, not so much. They didn't even know what caused it. So if you got leprosy, it was a death sentence. So why this big, long procedure that would have to take place that nobody ever had to go through. It's so funny because here's this guy who could potentially get this call and he'd have to like, okay, go open up the scroll and let's find it. Okay, we're in Leviticus scroll. Okay, where is it? There it is. I guess, okay, go get some cedar wood, get some hyssop, get a couple of birds and an earthen vessel. Or we're going to start doing this ceremony. Dude, you got to shave off your head, shave off, all, do all this stuff. Separate yourself. No doubt, this man, when he heard that he had to go and do all of that, was like, uh-uh, I've got to get out and tell people. I can't do that. And I, I don't know about you guys, but there's been times in my life where the Lord has blessed me, and I just have to shout it out from the rooftops. I'm just, i got to tell people about this. The Lord has done something amazing. And so if I was healed of advanced stages of leprosy, you better believe I would want to just start telling everyone. But Jesus says, no, don't go tell anybody. Go to the priest. Go through this procedure. Go through this ceremony. So let's take a look at what this guy did with his new start 
and life. Verse 45. However, the Lord has blessed this man. The Lord has healed this man. The Lord has given this man instruction for his new beginning. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in deserted places. And they came to him from every direction. The Lord has given us instruction for every aspect of our lives. How we're supposed to handle ourselves in marriage. How we're supposed to handle our finances. How we're supposed to parent our children. How we're supposed to do our job at work. We're tempted as human beings to trust ourselves to think that we know what's best. Now, let me ask you guys a question. How many of you have ever made a mistake? I've made a whole bunch of mistakes. You heard Robert up here leading worship earlier. He said he's one messed up guy. I mean, we make mistakes. We can't be trusted. That's just the cold, hard fact about our lives. We are not perfect. Take a look at society. Oftentimes, we're, we're tempted to go, okay, well, what does society say we should do? Now, has society ever made a mistake? Come on. I mean, we live in a society that's full of mistakes all the time. You can't trust society, but you take a look at God's Word. God's Word has never failed, ever. Everything He said would happen has happened exactly how He said it would happen. Anybody who follows His Word and does what He says can tell you, and I know I can attest to this, as I've done things the way God wants me to do them, everything has worked out perfectly. Every time I follow his word. How about you? We've experienced that, have we not? God's word is perfect. And yet we're tempted to do it our own way. Just like this man was tempted to do it his own way and gave in to that temptation. So this morning, as you're thinking about your new year, as you're thinking about 2014 and all it has to bring and all the successes you can have, I want you to learn three things from our text this morning. And the first thing is that when you do it God's way, you're going to touch the people. You'll touch the people. Leprosy was something that that people feared greatly. But you know, it's funny because the Lord knew all about leprosy. He knew what things that we know today. Things like this. Did you know that you can't catch leprosy from touching somebody that has leprosy? There's doctors that have been in third world countries for decades treating people, loving on people that have leprosy and they've never caught it. Prolonged Intimate exposure, in other words, you're around people and you're breathing in their, their air and you're, you know, basically, you're, you're with them all the time. Prolonged exposure to it is how you catch leprosy. You're not going to catch it by just touching somebody. And the thing is, we do this in life. We, we think, hey, you know what? This person's got this sin going on in their lives. I'm not going to touch that person. I'm not going to be around that person because I don't want to catch what they have. You know, maybe they're an alcoholic. Oh, I don't want to touch them. I'm going to catch their alcoholism. Or maybe they're a drug addict. Or maybe they're an adulterer. And you just think, if I'm around them, if I, if I accidentally touch them, I'm going to catch that. The thing is, if you're doing things God's way, you're going to touch the people. And the thing is, we can go one way or the other way. We can go way too far in touching the people. We can be like, you know, we're going to be around them all the time. And, and you know, I'm going to always be around these people that are just doing this sin. And yeah, you know, if you hang out in a barbershop, sooner or later, you're going to get a haircut. Believe me, I know. You hang out with sinners and they're sinning all the time and you're always around that sin and that's all you're around, yeah, you're going to, eventually, you'll fall in sin. But we can go the further way around. We can say, okay, well, I'm just going to stay so far away from it that I, I'm not able to actually touch their lives. Imagine if the Lord said, look, I'm, I'm going to stay away from that so I don't get infected by him. I'm not going to reach out and touch this man's life. I'm not going to have an effect on his life. I'm not going to speak into his life and bless his life. Imagine if the Lord did that. The man would still be dying and he would be, he wouldn't be in eternity with the lord i mean the lord reached out he touched this man's life 
we should be doing that as well. And you got to think about it this way. Did you know that a leper's only companion would be somebody else who's dying of the same disease? I mean, that's it. The only people he'd have to hang out with are people that are suffering the same way he is. It's a beautiful thing when we can come alongside somebody who's suffering from something and we can be a blessing in their life. Reach out and touch them and love them and show them how special they are and show them how much the Lord loves them. That's what God wants us to do. And so as you do it God's way, you certainly will touch the people. Also, number two is when you do it God's way, you're going to grow in knowledge and wisdom. You think this man, as he was off telling everybody, all the stuff the Lord had done. Do you ever think he stopped for a moment and thought, I wonder why he wanted me to go to the priest? Was there some lesson in that? Did he want me to learn something from going to the priest? Because if he would have stopped, think about it, what a blessing he could have had. I mean, just think about this. Two birds, one's killed in an earthen vessel, right? Think about the Lord. I mean, a bird is a heavenly creature, Imagine the Lord, a a heavenly being, coming down in an earthen vessel, being killed in an earthen vessel. Think about the blood that was sprinkled on the person who was to be made clean. Think about the cedar wood and how that represented the cross. Think about hyssop and how the, the Lord, as he hung on that cross, was offered a drink on a hyssop branch. All of this he would have been able to see if he would have done what the Lord asked him to do. It's a beautiful thing as we trust that God has us doing things a certain way, even though they might not seem to make sense to us. God has something very specific he wants us to learn. Think about this. He had to shave off all his head or his hair, shave off his eyebrows, shave all the hair off, clean himself. And so he's got a completely fresh start. It's like being born again. And God says, if you want to get to heaven, you have to be born again. All this, this man would have been able to see if he would have gone through what the Lord prescribed for him to go through. But all too often, we want to do it our way. We want to do it right now. This year, as you change maybe some of the things you've done, change your MO, maybe take a look at what the Lord's trying to teach you in the things that he's asked you to do. And the third thing, when you do it God's way, you're going to have an effective Christian life. This healed leper, even though his actions may have been well intended, they hindered the work of the Lord. They had a bad effect. Now all of a sudden, everybody's coming out of the woodwork. Everybody's thinking, hey, hey, go get John, man. He's got leprosy. Bring him over and go get Mary because she's got leprosy. And everybody's bringing everybody out and they're all around the Lord. And he had to do what? It says he had to withdraw and go to a deserted place. He couldn't stay in the city anymore. Now his work was hindered. He says, no, I don't want you to go tell everybody. I've got work I have to do right now. Just go to the priest. I've got something I want you to learn. And yet he goes out and does what he thinks is right, and it hindered the work of the Lord. When I was a young believer, you know, I was raised in a Christian home. My mom, my dad, they love the Lord. Both of them will tell you that they're born-again believers. Both of them have the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I see it in them. I see God working through them. And as I was raised up in their home, there was a point like everybody has in their life where they have to give their life to the Lord. You know, I, I couldn't say, okay, well, I was raised in a Christian home, so I'm Christian. No, I had a time in my life where I had to make that decision for myself. And the Christian home I grew up in, we went to the Catholic church. And so as I gave my life to the Lord, I didn't give my life to the Lord while I was going to the Catholic church. And so all of a sudden there was this thing in me like, hey, the Lord's done something great in me. He's changed me. I can feel it. I'm not the bad person. I'm not doing all these things I used to do. I'm living for the Lord. I'm doing great things. This is amazing. I was so excited and I wanted everybody to know that it didn't happen at the Catholic church. I wanted everybody to know that. Yeah, I I didn't get anything from that. That wasn't, you know, they're not doing it right over there. No, they're doing it right over here. Those people just, they've got it wrong. And so I was causing a division 
with people that God didn't want a division with. God says, no, my Holy Spirit does a work of unity. I want to bring people together. Don't you know that your mother and your father love me, Tim? Don't you know they care for me? Don't you know they love to bless my name? Don't you know they want to tell everybody about me? Don't you know that about your parents? And now there's this division because you want them to think that you've got something that they don't, but you both have the same thing, Tim. I was so zealous. I so wanted everybody to know. And I went out and I did what I thought was right. I thought I was helping the Lord. I thought I was helping him out. Hey, Lord, I got this. Let me just go tell everybody about the Catholic Church. God doesn't want us to be like that. He wants unity. He wants us to love one another. He wants us to bless him together. We do such a good job of messing things up when we do it our own way. And so this year, as you're planning out your 2014, as you've got all these plans, I want to challenge you this morning in two things. Number one, I want to challenge you to examine the way you're doing things. Because you have your goals, you have your plans, I know it. Are you going to do things the way you've been doing them for as long as you've been doing them for? Or maybe is it time to say, okay, Lord, how do you want me to do this? How do you want me to be a husband? How do you want me to be a mother? How do you want me to be a father? How do you want me to do my finances? How do you want me to do these things, Lord? And then do it the way he's telling you to do it. The second thing I want to challenge you guys in is this. Did you know that all throughout the scriptures, all throughout the gospels, you're finding that the Lord was healing people and he was telling them the same thing he told this leper. See to it that you don't tell anybody. And what is it that they always did? They went out and told everybody. At the end of Matthew's gospel, the Lord gives us what's called the Great Commission. He says, go out into all the world and make disciples of people. Tell them all about me. Tell them all about everything I've done for them. Make disciples of them and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want you to go out into all the world. Are we doing it? He tells these people, I've healed you. Don't say anything. And he tells us, hey, I've healed you. Go and tell everyone. Are we doing it? Are we sharing the Lord at the grocery store? Are we sharing the Lord at work? Or are we too afraid of what people might say? This year I want to challenge you. Go out and tell everybody what the Lord has done in your life. Amen?